Today is Wednesday, April 26, 2023, and we are back to the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are ready for Genesis chapter 46 tonight, so I want to invite you to be taking a Bible and be finding Genesis chapter 46. We'll be there in just a few moments. I hope you'll meet me there. But we're glad that you've joined us tonight. We want to also invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning, 930 for Bible class. We're continuing on with our study of Isaiah and then come together at worship uh, at 1030 as well. We'd love to see you there. We're having a special song and scripture service this coming Sunday. So uh, we want you invite to invite you to be with us in person this coming Lord's Day morning. And we would love to hear from you tonight. If you have any questions or comments or concerns, anything that uh, needs clarification from tonight's class, give me a call at 608-224-0274. I'd love to hear from you. We can get text or calls on that number or send me an email at fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And we want to hear from you in that way if you have any comments or questions. I'm here in my study on the southwest side of Madison, Wisconsin. And right as I'm recording this, it is somewhere between 3.30 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And our dog gets fed officially at 5 o'clock, but she starts getting hungry about 2 p.m. So she's really just staring at me right now. I wish you could see this. But uh, hopefully she doesn't interrupt class again, but she'll, uh, she'll get what's coming to her <laughs> in a little bit. But uh, tonight we are back to the book of Genesis. So this is the book of beginnings, and it is written by the prophet Moses, and we're now looking at the life of Joseph. And despite having been sold into slavery, uh, Joseph has worked his way up through the nation of Egypt. He is now ruling in Egypt. He saved the nation from this terrible famine, and he saved his family back in the promised land by sending them home with food. And now his brothers have headed back home to go get their father and to bring him and the rest of the family down to Egypt where they will live for the rest of the famine. So that brings us up to speed just by way of very brief review. And tonight we come then to Genesis chapter 46. So Genesis 46, the first paragraph is verses 1 through 4. So Genesis chapter 46, verses 1 through 4. So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions in the night of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will close your eyes. In verse 1, we have Israel, or Jacob, coming down to Beersheba. Beersheba was a city on the southern edge of the Promised Land, one of the last cities on the edge of the Negev, the desert area, uh, south of Israel. And this is the area where Abraham made an oath with Abimelech concerning the wells. You may remember from our study a few months back that uh, Abimelech's people were filling in the wells, and Abraham's people kept redigging those wells, and then finally they settled that dispute with an oath. So that was the area of Beersheba. So now Israel is heading south. He stops at Beersheba to offer sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And that right there is a little bit interesting to me, an interesting reference, the God of his father Isaac as opposed to the God of Abraham. Well, obviously Israel or Jacob would have had a deeper connection with his own father than with his grandfather. At least that's probably the way it is with most of us. And yet it's very easy for us to overlook Isaac sometimes. We hear the big three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we have a lot of information on Abraham. We got a lot of information on Jacob. But it's very easy to skip over Isaac. And so I just find it interesting that he refers to the God of his father Isaac in this little passage here. So Isaac is kind of sandwiched right between those two very, uh, very significant Bible characters of Abraham and Jacob. But this is very personal for Israel. God is the God of his father Isaac, and he's offering sacrifices. And he's obviously worried about this trip. He's, he's worried about what may come next. He's worried perhaps about the spiritual safety of his family, worried about moving to this far off land, uh, perhaps with a reputation for immorality, hoping that what happened to Lot and his family doesn't happen to his own family. Uh, certainly a lot of concerns would have been weighing very heavy on this man's mind. He's responsible for a lot of people. And so in this passage, God communicates with Israel through a series of visions in the night. Uh, remember, this is the patriarchal age, as we've sometimes referred to it in this book. This is the time when God communicated primarily through the, uh, the patriarchs or the heads of families. We've got Adam and Noah and Abraham. We've got these big characters spread throughout this book. 
But in these visions, notice God lets Israel know that he is not to be afraid. And a lot of times when somebody has to be told not to be afraid, there's a reason for that. Probably there's a good chance that they're afraid, or at least they're in danger of facing some fear. And so God communicates, instructs him not to be afraid, and based on God's message, uh, Israel is apparently worried about leaving the promised land. That's another big part of this. And it's a valid fear. God had given them this land where he and his family were currently living. And so he would obviously hesitate to leave this land, concerned that maybe they were violating God's will. I mean, how can we leave this land that God has given to us, that God has promised to my father and to my grandfather? And so God then steps in with this message, letting him know that, yeah, it's okay, you can leave. It's all right if you leave. It's okay if you go down there. You can head down to Egypt with God's permission. And God, in fact, reaffirms the promise, explaining that he will make Israel this great nation uh, down there. God will be with them, and God will bring them up again. So I will be with you seems to be the theme of this little message. So God also says that Joseph will close Israel's eyes. What an interesting way of describing that. In other words, Joseph would be present at the death of his father. And of course, this is addressed to Israel, the father. And so he's saying, your son will close your eyes at some point in Egypt while you are there. And I think this is simply to reassure Israel that it's okay to go down there. And it's very relevant uh, because they're, they're on their way. Uh, they're already in Beersheba, so they are heading in that direction. And now they're in what is basically the last city before heading on south through the desert. So this is something of a, of a point of no return. There's no food back home. We're about to head through the desert. This is it. And so maybe any last minute misgivings, any fears, these were allayed as God comes to him in these visions. So he's apparently nervous about leaving. But basically the summary of this opening paragraph here is that God tells him it is absolutely okay to go. You can go down there with my permission is basically what God is saying here. So let's continue then with Genesis 46 <clears throat> verses 5 through 7. Genesis chapter 46 verses 5 through 7. Then Jacob arose from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They took their livestock and their property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt, Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. In verse 5, they leave, and we notice here it is a huge caravan. I don't think it's ever really described as a caravan, but that is what it is. So Israel's sons carry their dad and their wives and their children using the wagons that were set up by Pharaoh. Remember we studied that a week or two ago where uh, Pharaoh gave Joseph permission to use his personal wagons and uh, horses and so on. So we note here uh, that Israel is apparently not able to walk on his own, but he is carried on this journey. He's too frail at this point. Uh, something's up with his health. We've studied this for a number of uh, years in his life now. He's been in a difficult health situation. Uh, but they pack up everything, and they head down south toward Egypt, taking along their livestock and their property, everything that they had acquired through the year. So this entire family heads south together along with all of their possessions. So we now come to a long list of names, and a lot of times it's very tempting to skip over this. Why do we need to know? This is like one of those genealogy chapters, but I think we'll find a, a few lessons coming from this. So we need to cover it because Moses put it in here for a reason. And remember who he's writing to. As Moses is writing, he's writing in the wilderness. So these are people who have been wandering for 40 years by the time he writes this. And they want to know, how do we end up here? Who are these people? How are we related to one another? And so he's writing this down in terms of a family history of the nation. So some of these names are going to be familiar. I think some of these may not be very familiar to us. So uh, we, we continue on then with Genesis 46, verses 8 through 18. I think I've kind of divided the names in half. I was tempted just to cover all of them, but it, <laughs> font would have become almost unreadable, so I kind of, kind of whacked that right in half. So let's look at Genesis 46, verses 8 through 18. Genesis 46, 8 through 18. Now these are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his sons who went to Egypt. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn. The sons of Reuben, Hanak, and Palu, and Hezron, and Carmi. 
the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, and Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, and Onan, and Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, and Pava, and Lob, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, <clears throat> Sered, and Elon, and Jalil. These are the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob and Padan Aram with his daughter Dinah, all his sons and daughters, number 33. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, and Haggai, Shunai, and Esbon, Arai, and Aradai, and Aralai. The sons of Asher, Imnah, and Ishva, and Ishvi, and Bariah, and their sister Sarah. And the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel. These are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Leah. And she bore to Jacob these 16 persons. Well, again, we split this huge name, uh, list of names in half. But this is the first part of it, starting with Reuben and his family, then Simeon, then Levi, then Judah, then Issachar, then Zebulun, all in verses 8 through 15. And then we have Gad and Asher and their children in verses 16 uh, through 18. And just so we don't miss this, I uh, just want us to notice that Moses is listing the descendants of Israel according to their mothers. And in this first part, he gives the sons of Leah, along with their children and their descendants, and the sons of Zilpah, along with their children. So this is the chart that we used earlier in Genesis. And of course, Zilpah being Leah's maid. You remember a few months ago when I first introduced this chart, I wasn't really sure how to do it. Do it in birth order or connect Leah and Zilpah? In hindsight, maybe I put, should have put Leah and Zilpah next to each other since Zilpah was Leah's maid. I don't know, but uh, Bilhah, Rachel's maid, was the first one to have kids after Leah. That's why I kind of put, uh, put her in the second column there. Uh, but anyway, hopefully this helps keep some of these straight. So we're talking about the children of Leah and Zilpah at this point. So we'll continue on with the rest in the next paragraph here. So let's continue with uh, Genesis 46, verses 19 through 27. Genesis 46, verses 19 through 27. The sons of Jacob's wife, Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, now to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin, Belah, and Becher, and Ashbel, Gera, and Naaman, Ehi, and Rosh, Muppim, and Huppim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob. There were fourteen persons in all. The sons of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Naphtali, Jahaziel, and Gunai, and Jezer, and Shillam. These are the sons of Bilhah, whom Laban gave to his daughter Rachel, and she bore these to Jacob. There were seven persons in all. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came to Egypt, his direct descendants, not including the wives of Jacob's sons, were 66 persons in all. 27 and the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70. So now we have Joseph and Benjamin, uh, the sons of uh, Rachel, and then we also have the reminder that Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph in the land of Egypt. We saw this happen back in Genesis 41. Uh, we have the sons of Benjamin. Then we come over to Dan and Naphtali, the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's servant. So those two uh, columns. Again, maybe I should have put those together, maybe not, just going in birth order, the original, the first time we went through this. But in verses 26 through 27 of what we just read, we have a summary. So kind of looking back over the whole chunk here, including Jacob and his direct descendants, not including the wives of his sons, uh, 66 people in all. And when we add in Joseph's family, we have a total of 70. And of course, with the daughters-in-law, it would have been a larger number, uh, but 70 in the core family. So that's kind of uh, just a summary of where we are in terms of numbers. Uh, this brings us to the last paragraph in this chapter, and we're going to conclude then tonight with Genesis 46, verses 28 through 34. Genesis 46, verses 28 through 34. Now he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out the way before him to Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh, and will say to him, My brother, 
my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, What is your occupation? You shall say, Your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. Well, as they travel, Israel sends Judah on ahead. If you remember, Judah is the fourth son. The first three had pretty much disqualified themselves from, from leading for various reasons. We've already covered that in this class. And so Judah, though, is the next in line. He's the one who has not disqualified himself from leadership yet. He's the one who had offered his own life in exchange for the life of his little brother, Benjamin. If you remember, he offered himself as a slave to Joseph when Joseph's silver cup was found in Benjamin's sack, and Benjamin was about to be kept as a slave himself. And so Judah, in Jesus' family tree, is selected by Israel to go on ahead. And I think we learn from that that Judah is trustworthy, isn't he? This is the guy. This guy has a leadership potential. So Judah has demonstrated his ability to be a leader. And so his dad picks him uh, to lead the way. And we almost see a parallel between this and how Jacob sent those waves of gifts on ahead of himself to meet Esau. So somebody's kind of leading the way here. But Judah goes first as a forerunner uh, heading down to the land of Goshen. Well, in verse 29, Joseph knows that they're coming. And so he saddles up the chariot, we might say, and he meets them in Goshen. And he meets his dad for the first time in more than 20 years. And they weep and they hug and they cry together for a long time. And in verse 30, Israel, basically, I'm ready to die. This is what I've been looking for. This was on my bucket list. This was, this was the only thing left that I hadn't done that I really wanted to do was to get to see my son Joseph. This is what he's been hoping for and living for. So his life is now complete as far as he's concerned. In the last half of this paragraph, Joseph preps his family for meeting Pharaoh. I think that'd be one way of summarizing this. Pharaoh's a powerful man. Joseph is also, but you're going to meet my boss kind of thing. And he suggests that they describe themselves as shepherds. So he's kind of putting words in their mouth. He's prepping them for this meeting. And the reason is shepherds are loathsome to the Egyptians. And we aren't really told the reason for this, maybe a cultural thing where that's a job that was looked down on. I think in our culture today, we have jobs that may be looked down on, very important things that have to be done. Um, but people may say, you know, don't grow up to do this or that. Well, I'm thankful I never got that talk from my dad. Um, my father always said, it doesn't matter what you do for a living as long as you are a faithful Christian. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm just saying that uh, to be a shepherd... Uh, to the Egyptians, that was just a terrible occupation. We just want to stay away from shepherds. They are beneath us. They're dirty. They're nasty. Uh, whatever they do, we don't want to have any part of that. And so we aren't really told the reason why he tells them to say that they're shepherds. But my guess is that he does this so that they get left alone. If you could just, again, put yourself back in Israel's position, as I mentioned a few moments ago, his fear, if I could put myself in his place as the leader of this huge clan, his fear is they're going to get kind of sucked in by the Egyptians. It's going to go the way of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, and Egypt is an evil place, so we, we need to eat. We've got to go to Egypt. That's our only option. But man, this guy is nervous, I think, as the spiritual leader of his family. How are we going to make it through? And it seems to me that Joseph perhaps might have had that same concern. And so he's saying, just tell them you're shepherds and they'll leave you alone. That seems to be kind of the code word here. We just want to do our own thing. We want to mind our own business. We don't want to get integrated into Egyptian society. We want our own little like family compound over here where we can just mind our own business and do our thing and eat and, and raise sheep and, and so on. So they're in, G they're in Egypt. But Joseph does not want them assimilating into Egyptian culture, which is interesting, coming from Joseph, who spent his life there. He's saying, I think, to his own family, you don't want to be a part of this. Uh, you need to be out there in the countryside on your own, away from everything that's happening. So he wants his family to be pretty much left alone. And this seems to be one way of accomplishing this. And this brings us to the end of Genesis chapter 46. So we have all of God's chosen people, this great family, uh, out there in the promised land, uh, away from the promised land now. They were up north in Canaan, but now they are down in the land of Egypt. 
So they're safe from the famine. So that's this mission accomplished. They're in a land where there is plenty of food. And we're now ready to see what happens next. So we hope to come together again next week to take a look at Genesis chapter 47. So we'll keep pressing forward. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 930 as we continue with Isaiah. And I say I want to see most of you every Wednesday. I kind of repeat that. Uh, I want to see all of you, but I realize that uh, some of you are very far away. Uh, we have listeners in uh, in New York State, and we have uh, family watching or listening in Ohio. There are people all over the place, so I'd love to see you this Sunday. Uh, I just realize it may not be a realistic objective. So uh, I say most of you I want to see in person this coming Lord's Day morning, 930, getting back to Isaiah. Uh, Caleb has done a wonderful job with that. I enjoy being in a class every week. I, that's important to me. Uh, to be able to get my cup filled and to learn something from uh, from the rest of the church. I really appreciate that. And then after class, we come together at 1030 for worship for that assembly. We'll have a special song and scripture service with emphasis on one another. So please don't say, I hate singing. I'm going to skip this one. That's, uh, that's not the way we need to be thinking. We're going to have uh, some scripture readings, different men of the congregation taking turns with that. A few more songs than normal. And then Gary will be bringing a brief lesson this week. So I'm just really looking forward to that. But let's close tonight by uh, going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. And tonight we're especially thankful for the word that came through your servant Moses, the book of Genesis. We're thankful for your continued providential care of your people. And we know that you've promised to always be with us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we've seen that promise fulfilled through Joseph. We pray, Father, for your continued care and for your love and provision for us even today. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you tonight in his name. Amen.